uh, I'll start slow since people are still sort of wandering in. Um, before I dive in, I want to say that uh, the monadical coding challenge, whoa, it's not on the screen. Uh, monadical's running a coding challenge. We have these little pamphlets that we're handing out. Uh, there are two problems. If you can solve the second one uh, and your solution is the best, you get a free ticket to PyCon next year. Um, and the second best and third best, we have other prizes like uh, parapente, dinner, and a bunch of other fun stuff. So get your submissions in before tomorrow at 1 p.m. and uh, you'll be put in for some prizes. So my name is Nick Sweeting. I'm co-founder of a company called Monatical. We actually have a bit of an interesting history. We started as a poker startup. And my co-founder and I, Max, originally moved to Columbia about three years ago uh, and fell in love with it. And so we decided to start our company here. Um, Medellin is just amazing and, and Bogota was incredible as well. And the, the tech community was so welcoming and the environment was so perfect for what we wanted to do that we set up our initial whole company in Colombia, stayed here for a year, uh, and then after that we became fully remote. My co-founder and I moved back to Montreal, uh, but we love to come back and attend PyCon and, and see everyone here. Um, so before I dive into the archiving stuff, a quick disclaimer, I am not a professional internet archiver. I may say wrong things. Uh, there are people on the internet who know a lot more about this than me. I've just started to write a little bit of tooling over the last few years, and I've learned some lessons that I'd like to share with y'all. So, to start on a personal note, why am I here today talking to you all about Internet Archive? Why do I care about this at all? Well, where I grew up, we didn't have super reliable Internet. It was often only two megabits per second, sometimes only one megabit per second. The ping was often over 100 milliseconds. And things would go down, and the internet would act a little bit weird. Sometimes you feel like the internet was watching you. For example, if you Googled 1984 Tiananmen Square Massacre, your whole house's internet would mysteriously go down for about half an hour. And it's strange because when you go to Google, or at least this was six years ago, you'd see the little HTTPS lock in the nav bar, and yet somehow your house's internet would still go down for half an hour whenever you Googled things that the government didn't want you to Google. So I grew up in an environment where the internet was heavily censored, but it was also unreliable in other ways. Whenever media would get posted that either the government or people in power disagreed with, it would often be taken down via other means, not just via censorship. So it made me think a lot about the fact that not everyone has free access to content like many of us do. If you grow up in North America or even most of South America or Europe, you probably have nowadays a fairly reliable internet connection. It might not be perfect, it might only be five megabits per second, but it won't block content most of the time. So, it's important for those of us who have that privilege to think about the people in the world who don't and how not having access to all the information can have a major effect on your point of view of what's happening in the world. A large portion of the population in China doesn't see any of the headlines that people not in China see. Stuff just gets blocked or never gets shared in the first place. So internet archiving is not just a way to save content for long-term durations, for thousands of years, it's also a way to share content and redistribute it now to the people who can't access it normally. So, when I was in China, I'd find like a New York Times article that I wanted to share with a friend, or something posted on Weibo, and that's the, that's the local blogging site. And I'd collect the links over the course of a week, and maybe I'd send them to a few friends. And often I had the experience of sharing a link, and a friend messages me, and they say, hey, it's blocked, or hey, it's 404 and it went down. And I really got tired of this, because I felt like a lot of the good content that I care about on the internet was just disappearing. It's like sand falling through your hands. So I made a little tool called Pocket Archive Stream. So Pocket is a tool created by Mozilla that lets you bookmark things. And you get a little queue uh, similar to Instapaper or Pinboard, or there are many services that do this. So I just set up a quick little command line tool so that everything I bookmarked got saved on my computer locally. 
And then from there, I put it on a server, so it was rehosted as static URLs. And that way, if something went down, I could just go to my little personal archive of my corner of the internet, copy the URL, and give it to my friend. And they're like, whoa, this was blocked 30 minutes ago. How'd you do that? So this tool really wasn't that impressive. Um, it didn't do anything novel. And I didn't really have high hopes for it becoming anything. Then in 2017, the Equifax breach happened. So I don't know if it, if it made the news here or how big of a deal it was outside of the US, but in the US this was a very big deal. Equifax is a credit monitoring company. So they essentially have access to all of your financial records, most of your financial records, and they form a credit score, which is how reliable you are in, in the eyes of banks. And they got hacked. Well, they didn't really get hacked, they just exposed a lot of information and it was downloaded by many, many people. So this was a huge deal. Up until this point, people had largely just trusted these companies blindly. So when Equifax announced their breach, they did a very silly thing. Instead of going on equifax.com slash breach announcement, they registered a whole new domain called equifaxsecurity2017.com. A ridiculous domain. Who does this, right? Security people know that the root of trust on the internet is often your domain. When you go to Da Vivienda, you look in the URL bar to see that it's davivienda.com. When you go to Amazon, you look in the URL bar to see that it's amazon.com. If one day you clicked a link and it went to amazongreatshoppinghere.com, you would be a little bit suspicious, right? <laughs> So Equifax should not have done this. They should have used their domain that people trust to announce a breach. And instead, they registered one that nobody knew about, and it had a lot of words, so it's easy for typos to be in there. So what do scam artists do when they see an announcement like this? They immediately register thousands of domains of every possible typo variation or word being switched. Security Equifax 2018, Equifax Security 2018, Security Equifax, Equifax Security. You know, every possible combination, they'll go and register it. Because what does this site do? This is the site where you go to see if your information was leaked by Equifax. And everyone in the US wanted to know, was my information leaked? So they all went to this website, and what did the website ask for? Your social security number, your home address, your full name, everything that could be leaked all over again. Needless to say, I thought, they needed some good trolling. <laughs> this is not an acceptable thing for a multi-billion dollar company to do. So I looked at their site, Equifax Security 2017. I'm like, OK, this is a pretty simple site. I'm just going to clone it. I'm going to put it in my pocket archive stream and download it and see what I can do with it. So I downloaded it. I put it back up. And I bought the domain Security Equifax 2017. Yeah, so I switch Equifax Security and Security Equifax. The fact that I can't even remember which one it is now shows how bad of a domain it was. So this was their original site. I downloaded it, just opened the index.html and sublime text, and I changed a few words. Not a big deal. So now, Equifax Security was the real one, and securityequifax.com, with a little lock icon, with Let's Encrypt, was this. So. This wasn't really a big deal. Anyone can do this. You can all go and download a website and change a few words, right? It's not going to have that big of an impact on the world, because who's going to go to this site if they're linking to the official one everywhere, right? Well, I want to show you something. So look what Equifax did. Their support reps started typing my fake website URL in their tweets, their official tweets. And they recommended thousands and thousands of people go to my phishing version of the site, the one that says cybersecurity incident, which is totally fake. And none of them ever checked it. So I had no idea this was going on. One day I get an email from some random person on the internet uh, about 20 days after the initial breach had happened. So I had completely forgotten about this site. It was five minutes of my time. I was just trolling them for fun. 
Once I got this email, I checked the stats. Over 200,000 people had visited it that day and typed in their information. And it was on track to cross 2 million over the next two or three days. So this is just a funny story to illustrate that if you have the power to clone content on the internet, you have the power to re-host it and misrepresent content that people would trust from a different source. So archiving the internet is great, and archiving news articles is great, but with that power comes responsibility. And there's really a deep sense of ethics that needs to be consulted when you're archiving stuff. Do you have permission to re-host this person's content? What about copyright law? Is it an article that you're allowed to just copy and put up on a new domain? And what if everyone did this? What if everyone started modifying websites and re-hosting them and pre pretending to be other things? So as we go further into internet archiving, I want you to think about this story as a tale of caution of the power and the responsibility that comes with cloning things. So an interesting side effect of this whole fiasco um, was that when the New York Times covered it, they mentioned the Linux command wget. Many of you probably know this command. It's one of my favorites. And someone on Hacker News posted that this was actually only the second ever mention of wget in New York Times history. And that's a little bit sad because everyone uses wget. It's an incredible tool. And many people don't know all the things that wget can do. It's actually extremely versatile. If you only use it to download a zip file or clone a repository every now and then, you're way under using it. So wget is powerful, but you need to know how to use that power. This is the full list of options that I've come up with after years of using wget to perfectly clone a website. But once you have this, it's easy. So I want to demo it. This is something you could all do, is clone a website. Uh, let me just move my window over. So let's clone the PyCon website. What it's doing here is it's downloading the main index.html, and it's looking through for all the URLs that point to other resources. It's downloading those resources, and then in the HTML file, it's rewriting those URLs to refer to the local files instead of the ones on PyCon.com. And it just works, right? It does this all behind the scenes, and then, cross my fingers, we'll see how well it actually worked. So this is a perfect clone of the PyCon website. This is completely local off of my file system. It's not making external requests. It's actually downloaded all of these images. Um, it's downloaded what media it can, but it probably didn't download that YouTube video. So it's not perfect, but it's very, very powerful. You can archive and clone most sites with this. And then you have a perfect offline local copy. So what are the shortcomings of wget? Right? It's a great tool, but the biggest one is that it doesn't run JavaScript. So if your page makes dynamic requests to other things as it's loading, wget is not a browser. It's just a very smart tool with a lot of regex <laughs> or uh, other string matching things where it looks for URLs. So if we want to archive a super dynamic site, like a single page app or a game or anything interactive, how do we do that? How do we handle user interaction where they click something and make a request to a server? And then, how do we handle the dreaded single page app? It doesn't behave like anything else on the internet. Uh, it, it breaks all the rules of the internet because requesting each individual page, they're all really just the same page. And then the JavaScript on the page is doing the, uh, the actual rendering of different content. So this really breaks internet archiving. Please stop building single page apps. <laughs> if that's, that's the only takeaway from this conference. <laughs> or from this talk. And then another thing to consider is the output of wget is static HTML. So what happens in 20 years when browsers are totally different? How are we going to render that HTML accurately? And how are we going to have long-term archives on the scale of hundreds of years? So what if instead of having a command line tool that doesn't really understand how the web works, we actually just use the browser? So a few years ago, Chromium released Headless Chrome. 
And this revolutionized a lot of web development. There were, th there were things before that could do similar things, like Selenium, um, but it was always sort of a janky process where you have a browser and a driver, and the driver hooks into the browser and tells the browser to do specific things, but they're not really in the same environment. It's, it's like two separate tools. Headless Chrome, finally, is one environment. It's like you're in a Node environment. You can run JavaScript with all of the memory context of the page. So now we can archive dynamic content with high fidelity. Interactive things, games, single page apps. So let's compare a few of the different tools. WGET is one that we already saw. One of the best ones that uses a headless browser is Web Recorder. So this is Web, web Recorder. Um, it's, it's created by an amazing project, uh, a company called Rhizome. Uh, they build a lot of web archiving tools, but this one in particular is fantastic. So it lets you choose between Firefox or Chrome as your rendering engine, um, and then it, it essentially records all of the requests that are made while you're interacting with the page. And then when you revisit the archive later, it just checks the request headers to see if the requests match up, and it'll pretend to be the server and serve exactly what the page needs to render. So this is essentially the perfect ideal goal that we all have when doing internet archiving. But Web Recorder is sort of set up to archive individual pages one at a time. What if we want to archive all of our bookmarks or millions of sites at a time? So archive.org has this goal. They want to do similar things. They use a tool called, oops, they use a tool called Heratrix. Heratrix is sort of a uh, decade's worth of engineering effort, effort, and it's what powers archive.org. So if you haven't used archive.org before, uh, you just go and they essentially have a backup of millions of pages on the internet, um, mirrored in the US, uh, in Canada, and, and elsewhere in the world as well. So they have a lot of experience doing this. So let's talk a little bit about the future of internet archiving. We have little tools that run on our laptops. We have bigger tools that run on centralized companies like archive.org. But is that really the best way to archive most of the internet? Are the central archives the ones that survive through the ages? What happened to the Library of Alexandria? That was a big central archive. It was set on fire and we lost all of those records. What happened to all of the priests that collected manuscripts over thousands of years? Well, they got attacked because another religion wanted to burn their church down. So a lot of the archives that we have over millennia turn out to be the little scraps of paper that were just in the corner of someone's room or in a notebook that got put away in a chest of drawers. It's the distributed archives that are spread out everywhere. The little bits that we all store individually will survive through the ages. And the big ones will too, but it's nice to have redundancy. Another thing is that a central authority like archive.org doesn't actually have the capacity to archive the entire internet. They don't have nearly enough hard drives. But if we each archive the small bits of the internet that we care about on our own hard drives, then together we'll cover a much larger portion of the internet than any central organization can. So an interesting thing happens when you start to archive a lot of the internet and spread it out over all of our computers. People start to think, why should I pay for hosting? If I publish something, it's going to be archived in 20 different places, and then they can just visit it there. Why should I even have to host my own website? So in 20 years, we might see an interesting effect where as more content gets mirrored automatically around the internet, people don't really bother with hosting their own versions anymore. It sort of naturally becomes distributed because people start to rely on the fact that the internet will remember. So let's think back to the Equifax incident. And remember the, uh, the ethical dilemmas of cloning content. Think about what happens if we clone the entire internet and it were to last forever, and everything you did on the internet would be remembered forever with no way to delete it. Is that a good thing? Is that something we really want? Maybe part of what makes the internet beautiful is that people do things that they know they wouldn't otherwise do if it would be remembered forever. You might not post a risky blog article. You might not 
you know, do some incredible journalism that might get you in trouble 100 years from now. People might not engage with communities that could be dangerous for them in the future. So if we archive absolutely everything and we have no way to take it down, that might actually not be too great. And the European Union thought about this when they created the, the right to forget. And this is a law that essentially means that people have a right to be forgotten off of the internet. If someone is hosting something that's either incorrect or misleading about you, you can request that it get taken down, or at least delisted from search engines. So when we build these big distributed versions of the internet, we have to think about very carefully about how people can request that their content be taken down. And individually, when we archive each other's content, we should also be mindful of the fact that we're not the original owners. Um, you're essentially cloning content for personal use, and if you publish it, you should make sure to accept takedown requests. Don't violate copyright law. Um, don't, don't share it widely, don't put it in search engines, right? You're just mirroring content in case it goes down. You don't want to be the original hoster of it. So, as you archive things locally, curate your archive. Choose carefully what you put in it, and choose good content. Because there might be such a thing as too much data. If we archive absolutely everything, then it's going to be hard to search through and sift through. And tools will get better as we go on, but this is something to think about. So I've talked a lot about sort of the overall ecosystem, but how can you actually archive things today? Right? I showed you wget, uh, but that doesn't do everything. So what used to be Pocket Archive Stream, the tool that I introduced early on, has since grown into something called Archivebox. And it's a much larger project with an active community and many contributors. I want to just show it quickly because we've collected a community page wiki that has a lot of resources. So this is what it looks like when you run Archivebox. And it can take your browser history, it can take bookmarks, it can take RSS feeds, any stream of links that you feed it, it will automatically archive. And it's a one-shot command line tool. It runs wget, headless Chrome, YouTube DL. It'll clone Git repositories automatically. It'll download any large media files it finds. It'll take a screenshot. It'll save the website as a PDF. It'll dump it to text. It'll do literally everything it possibly can to archive the sites via multiple methods. And the redundancy is important. But I don't want to focus on the, the tool. I want to focus more on the community. So there's a huge community of people that do this professionally. I mentioned archive.org. They have a team called Archive Team that you can join. And they're essentially a task force that finds things that need to be archived on the internet. When something gets censored, they post on Reddit and say, hey, everyone quickly archive this thing before it gets taken offline. So when Tumblr started to delete a lot of content or when YouTube starts to take a lot of videos down, they're the ones who go and save it for, for the ages. Even if you don't want to interact and, and help out with that effort, uh, you can donate to them and it makes a big difference. A lot of them are volunteers and they have minimal resource, resources. Uh, the web reporter team I also mentioned, uh, Rhizome is the company. They have created something called PYWB, which is, in my opinion, the best web archiving software suite there is for Python right now. It is the back end for webreporter.io. So it's a full Python toolkit for doing everything you need to archive. It'll ingest links, it'll save it with a headless browser, it'll manage the index of the links, it'll allow you to save multiple versions, and it all has a beautiful Python API. And then the old Dominion University has an internet archiving, or sorry, the web science team does internet archiving as well, and they built something called IPWB. So it's essentially PWB saving to IPFS. IPFS is a, is a globally distributed file system. So it's, it's an interesting way to think about distributed archiving. We could all save websites individually on our own computers, or we could have a central authority choose what to save and then save it to a distributed file system that automatically spreads the files across everyone. Which one will win overall? I don't know. We'll see in 20, 30 years. And keep in mind, in the future, we'll have to run our operating systems in a VM just to run the browser to be able to render the pages correctly. So this is going to be a very interesting problem moving forwards as browsers evolve and add more features. There are many other amazing projects. Uh, the Archives Unleashed team has done a lot of cool statistical analysis of how quickly websites go offline. Uh, IIPC is sort of an overarching organization that connects a lot of the individual communities. Um, and there are many fantastic conferences and, and tools and 
blog articles and people to follow, and we've collected it all in this wiki for you. So I'll post the link at the end on the final slide, and my slides will be available on GitHub. I highly recommend checking out this wiki, even if you never run any web archi archiving tools yourself. So a final note to end on is that it's actually very easy to archive Wikipedia and TED Talks and Project Gutenberg. They're all available freely, and you're allowed to rehost them. So I created some documentation called Wikipedia Mirror on GitHub that walks you through rehosting all of Wikipedia. So on my server at home, I have the entire English Wikipedia, Project Gutenberg, all of Stack Overflow, and the Chinese Wikipedia. And all together, it's only about 200 gigabytes. And the awesome thing is that the English Wikipedia archive is only 80 gigabytes for 6 million articles and images. All of the images in all of Wikipedia are offline on my server. It's incredible. So if everyone does this, if everyone works on rehosting Wikipedia, it won't go down as often. Wikipedia often gets targeted by DDoS attacks uh, that they can't really handle because they don't have that many servers. Or governments will take them down because they don't like one article that's on Wikipedia. They just shut down the entire site. This really, really affects people. They can't do their homework, they can't study, they can't, academic research grinds to a halt. The government uses it. So when huge resources like this get taken down by governments, it's really important that we all step in to help and rehost it. So that's the URL if you wanted to take a picture of the web archiving wiki that has all the resources. Um, I'm gonna move to the next slide because it also has a link to the, the slides that has this as well. So that's the end of my talk. I would like you to all go home and try archiving one website. Try archiving one news article that you really care about. And just leave it in a folder and put the command that you use to archive it in a little bash script. And forget about it. But I bet in 10 days, you'll want to archive something else that you think might go down. And then a week from then, you're going to be like, oh wait, that was super useful. I want to archive something else. And pretty soon, you'll be collecting a little treasure trove of the part of the internet that you really care about. And it may end up being just as valuable as the home videos that you collect or photos or writing that you produce. Because we're so entrenched with the internet these days that it really is a part of who we are. It's a snapshot of how we interact with the world. And having your own personal curated archive is an incredible resource that you should all try. So as a final note, um, I mentioned I work for Monatical. We're a full stack development company founded in Medellin. Started as a poker site. Now we're doing consulting and we're hiring. Finish that quiz that I mentioned first and you get to skip to the final stage of the hiring interview process. That's it, thank you for your time.